Glory to God. We bless the name of God. Hallelujah. A testimony came in last night. Someone that had pile. Totally healed by the power of God. Amen. It wasn't in this meeting. I know why I mentioned it wasn't in this meeting. It happened during the Rafa series. This person just sent a meeting yesterday because he wanted to test himself to be sure. And it has not returned again till now. Amen. Many testimonies, pains. Last night, someone had excruciating pains. If I, I wish I could share this, I can read it. Service was going on. You know, yesterday, end point that I was pain. The person is dramatic in the way she shared the testimony. But healing has come. That's the important thing. And it is permanent. Hallelujah. You are the next to testify. Many more things God is doing here. Glory to God. Help me say something nice to your neighbor this morning. By the way, we are looking very sweet this morning. There will be many pictures after this service. As it should be. Hallelujah. God bless you. Be seated. Glory to God. The expression and the instrumentalists have been very powerful. I've been getting blessed this morning. Glory to God. You know, it's such a blessing as a pastor to have, first of all, instrumentalists who are in the service and who are connected to the service. Amen. Uh, they're connected to the service. They know what to play at every time. Amen. So we'll celebrate them. Amen. Yeah, you can celebrate them. Of course, in this church, if you have not gone through your PGTI basic, you can't even play instrument for us. You can't even clean toilets. So let's not even go there. Glory to God. Again, we'll celebrate you. This morning, like I promised you, I'm doing a teaching on when the going gets tough. Okay? It's a ministration of divine wisdom and the ministration of supernatural faith. So there will be wisdom communicated and there will be impartations in the process. Are you here? And I'm going to say a lot in the area of finances. When things become tough, when there is lack, just like in Nigeria now, that is famine. But not, just, not only in Nigeria now, globally. No, that's not a, that wasn't a joke. I hope you know. When I said that is famine, I wasn't like cracking joke. That is actually famine. Go read everything used to define famine and check Nigeria. There's no difference. So even go globally, things are not looking good anywhere. Okay? Even though it looks like an era is doing poorly, but the dollar too is doing poorly now. Are you aware? Many people abroad will tell you things have never been as expensive as it is now, even over there. So how do you navigate times like this, difficult times like this? And some of us in different parts of our life are having issues. There is lack, there is this. And whether you are in lack now or not, the thing is there must be a time that you will need money and you might not have as much as you need. How do you navigate difficult moments when there are debts piling up? When the situation is looking bad? When nothing seems to be working? How do you navigate through those seasons? How do you handle debts? How do you handle lack? How do you handle scarcity? How do you handle famine? The first thing I'd like you to know is this. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. If you're here in the first service, okay, I'm preaching the same message. But with mightier utterance. <laughs> 
So why do you preach the same message in first and second service? Because it is first and second service. It's the same service, and I'm saying this for a reason, it's the same service split into, two, as, in, as in happening two times. So we want to make sure that if you're in the first service, you missed nothing. If you're in the second service alone, you missed nothing. Are you following? Yes. So that's what we do. We try to make sure, notice if the choir administration is the same song. Did you observe? The testimony is the same thing. So that if you attend just one, you will be fine. But some, some of the workers have to attend to because they have to officiate. And if I that category, always get set for extra impartation. That's what it means. Because I can tell you, you can preach the same message seven times and say seven different things, explain the same thing. Okay, maybe you might not even say seven different things, but the people will hear seven different things. So if you're not in the first service, you missed nothing. And you're going to miss nothing this morning. Because the same word is coming powerfully. Are you following me this morning? And I will encourage you, except you're worker and you're officiating, it's okay to attend only one service. So that you use the second service or the other service to go and bring people that were supposed to come with you, you invite them for the second service. It's okay to attend one service. The impartation, the blessing will be the same. Because if we let people attend, imagine the number that attended first service, if you bring them into this hall now, there will be no space for people to sit. So it's okay to attend one service. Say amen. God is increasing us. We are getting bigger. We are getting better. I'm trusting God that if we are here next year, we need a third service. Say amen. amen. Not just as PG National, but as Enugu Center particularly. Amen. We need a third service because God will increase us much more. Amen. Shout amen, somebody. Amen. And if we need a third service as Enugu Center, it means national meetings. We're having four services for national meeting. Is that not a blessing? <laughs> so some workers will be leaving church by four. <laughs> as usual. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, it's good to have good problems. There are problems that are good problems. Even the natural. If a woman is pregnant, that's a good problem. True or false? You say, I'm feeling so, I say, yes, we understand. Glory to God. So there are good problems. So where your church is growing beyond your capacity is what? It's a good problem. Amen. But where you have a church that can sit 500 people and you have only about 25 people inside, it's a bad problem. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the first thing, look at this verse. There had no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. The first thing you must know about difficult moments, tough times, is that there is no tough time that comes to you that you are not able to handle. Now, if you are not able to handle it, God won't let it come. Now, God doesn't bring tough times. I have a few teachings to prove that. I won't go into that this morning. I have a teaching on why bad things happen to believers. I have a, I have a book, The God You Never Knew. Somewhere in that book, you will learn how and why bad things happen. But you see, it's never from God. However, even when the devil is running his riot, God will never sit back and watch the devil bring a challenge to any believer that he cannot handle. He won't do that. Look at it. God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. He won't let you be tempted above what you can handle. See other translations, like NLT. He said the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. He said, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. So I said, there is no challenge coming to you that you cannot handle and you cannot overcome. It's one of the proofs of God's faithfulness to you. And so if there's any challenge in your life, the first thing you should know is that it is not bigger than you. And this alone can change how you look at situations. It can change how you look at problems. It is in my life because it's not bigger than me. Never get to a point where you feel, the devil makes you feel, this one is too much, oh. 
this one will kill me. There is no temptation in your life that are different from what others experience. He said, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted. He said, he will not allow temptation to be more than what you can stand. So I gave an example with Job. Do you observe, even when the devil tempted Job, God still made sure he put his restriction on how much the devil can go. I get the point. He told him, don't touch his soul. Why do you think in the whole thing, Job's wife did not die? Did you observe that? There are possibilities that God has checked. If this Job's wife dies, maybe that's the point he can't, he can't handle. Because God is still had plans of giving him children and every other thing. So he made sure that he didn't go beyond what he could handle. And it doesn't matter how big you think your problems are. It is not more than what you can handle. It's not more than what you can overcome. If it is there, it's because God trusts that you can handle it. I feel sometimes God says to the devil, you go try, my son will overcome. Are you following me this morning? You go try, my daughter will prevail. Somehow he knows that you will win. There is no problem, no lack that is coming that is too much for you. You have the grace, the ability to be able to overcome it. And that should settle in your mind. So when challenges are coming, you don't meet them as though it's an impossible thing. I kind of know, even as a pastor was saying in first service, there is no trouble that comes to this church that I cannot overcome. None. None. If it will be bigger than me as a minister, God will let it come. Because God is faithful. Are you following me this morning? He's faithful. There is no challenge rising in your family now that is bigger than you. None. There is nothing happening around your life now that is bigger than you. If it's in your life now, it's because you can overcome it. You can overcome it. You can overcome it. And that's a very comforting thing. Put up like Amplify Classic of this verse. You see how small it is. Let's read together. No temptation, no trial, regarded as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads, has overtaken you and laid hold on you that is not come out to man. He said, that is no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance and that is not adjusted and adapted and belonging to human experience and such as man can bear. What did he say next? But God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature and he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and as said beyond your ability and the strength of your resistance and power to endure. Shout amen somebody. There is nothing coming to you that you can't handle. Nothing. And so when things happen to people and I see them complain, I kind of feel somebody should tell them you can handle it. Let me touch somebody say you can handle it. Tell the person you can overcome it. Do you, I talk to you say you can overcome it. You can. Glory to God. And that should comfort many of you. But not just comfort, that should encourage you to walk and to believe. Amen. Are you getting the point? Do you want to check? Get, put up mercy. Uh, no, passion. The passion translation. Put up the passion translation. Oh, hallelujah. After the passion, we look at the message. Pro passion, TPT, First Corinthians 10, 13. Hallelujah. Not 13, verse 10, 10, verse 13. You're almost there. Let's do like a mask wife forget it. Are you guys ready? One, when they get it. Are you ready? Let's go. We all experience times of testing, which is normal for every human being. Let's get to the point. What does this say? But God will be faithful to you. He will screen and filter the severity, nature, and timing of every test or trial you face so that you can bear it. I get to the point. He, he, he checks the severity, the nature, the timing. He will make sure it will not come at a time that you will break down. Are you following me, everybody? So whatever that is happening to you, you can actually face it and, and win. You can. 
And that is renewed strength. Now, things are going bad in Nigeria. It will never go beyond what you can handle. Are you following me? Is that encouraging? Is that comforting? Put up message Bible. So you check the severity, the nature, and the timing. Message said, no test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to do, all you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He will never let you be pushed past your limits. He won't. So whatever that is in your life now, God won't let you be pushed past your limits. So if it's in my life now, it's because I can overcome it. And you will overcome. Ah, you can, I say you will overcome. Amen. Don't worry, see it. All those challenges, you will break through and overcome. That's why he's God. That's why he's God. So first thing I said, I want you to remember that there is no situation that God will let come to you that you cannot overcome. Second thing I want you to remember is that in every situation, God has already made a way out of that situation. Go back to that King James. You go from King James to message, to, to amplify and all of that. He says, look at this. There are no temptation taking you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the, wish, with the temptation also make a way to escape. So, whenever there is a problem, God will always ensure that he makes a word of escape. Always. Put up Amplified Classic. So sometimes what you need to find out when you're in trouble is to find out the way that God has made. Because whenever there is a problem, he has made a word of escape. The end, last part of that verse said, but with the temptation, he will always also provide the way out, the means of escape to a landing place that he may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up on it patiently. So, so when there is a problem, you are in lack, you are in debt, things are not working, God already has provided an escape route. So what you need to do is to find that escape route. So two things I like you to know when things are going bad. One, I can bear this. Two, there is a way. Do you hear what I'm talking about? One, I can bear this, I can overcome it. Two, there is a way out of this. I may not know what that way is now, but the Bible says once the problem is coming, God has already made the way. Do you believe God's word? Put up message. Put up message. If I look at passion. Put up message. No test that comes your way is beyond the cost of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He will never let you be pushed past your limit. He will always be there to help you out. To help you come through it. Passion said, we all experience times of testing which is normal for every human being. But God will be faithful to you. He will screen and filter the severity, the nature, and timing of every test or trial you face so that you can bear it. And each test is an opportunity to trust him more. For along with every... Oh, let's read that part. Along with every trial, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out of it victoriously. So just, he didn't say he will provide. Once there is already trial on ground, the way is already there. Are you following me this morning? Once there is something happening now, he has already provided a way of escape. So I can never get to a point in my life where I say things like, I don't even know how to handle this. I know how. God has made the way. Are you following me? Third thing I want you to remember, when there is trouble or trial, is that no trouble, no tough times are designed to last forever. Even the Englishman tells us, tough days eh? don't, but, have you seen, have you heard that statement? Tough days don't last, but tough people do. No challenge is designed to last forever. I told you, that's why if a challenge is staying beyond normal, you can stand and face it. Because in the design of God, no problem is meant to last forever. The best I've seen, if you take the Bible, was Job. Job suffered affliction, but all those Job's affliction lasted for only nine months. Only nine months. Only nine months. 
Are you getting the point? But you see, look at Job's case now. Number one, God didn't let him be, to be pushed beyond his limits. Number two, God already made a of escape. Number three, God made sure that did not last forever. Twelve days don't last forever. Things will not always remain like this. Let me tell you, say, neighbor, 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 or sister, whichever one. Find out the person's name so that you can call the person's name. Brother this or sister this. Tell the person the issue will not last forever. Say it will not last forever. This situation is not staying forever. You are finding a way of escape. Shout amen, somebody. Now, the story I'm considering today is the story of Isaac in Genesis 26. Is someone getting encouraged this morning? Because there will be encouragement, but there will be impartation. And there will be wisdom. The story of Isaac in Genesis 26, verse 1. How do you survive tough times? Especially in the area of finances. I'm saying there was famine in the land. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Now you see again, that confirms what 1 Corinthians 10 said. That there is no trouble coming to you now that is not common to man. What it means that there's nothing happening to you that has not happened before. There's nothing you are passing through that you are the first person that is happening to. Moses is telling us there was famine, but reminding us that there have been famine before now. So don't ever think that what you are passing through, that nobody has passed through it. This is the highest. That's a life from the pit of hell. And I say it again and again, I'm a pastor. And I, as a pastor, I have the privilege to sit and listen to people's problems. Sometimes, for real, I'm not downplaying your tears. But sometimes when people cry and complain, I smile because if only they know what others are going through, you will know that that's not the worst. And sometimes, the person going through those things is also smiling and encouraging them. Are you following me? Now, he said there was famine in the land beside the first famine, so there has been a famine before. Did you observe there was famine in the days of Abraham? There was famine in the days of Isaac. There was famine in the days of Jacob. There was famine in the days of Joseph that made him do whatever in Egypt. Every generation there was famine. So there will also be famine. Even when your children come, there will be famine. I feel like I'm talking about. There will be tough days. You know, these days we look at you look at some old news and you see things like there was a time. A car was selling for 400 naira in Nigeria. I hope you're aware. That's the time. But do you also know that people that were alive then were still saying this country is so bad? My point has never been a time where everybody is saying this country is now very good. When was that? So whatever you're facing now, people are faced. I, I get the point. So Abraham had for mine, now it was Isaac's turn. Now, Isaac went on to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Jerah. Verse 2. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, If I continue, the Lord appeared unto him and said, So he turned to the Lord. The Lord began to talk to him. Hear what I'm going to say. The first thing that will help you conquer adversity is to first acknowledge God as your source. Acknowledge that God is your source. The job is not the source. The economy is not your source. They are just channels. If someone says, if God says, I'm going to give you a car, and after he told you that, somebody walks up to you and says, I'm going to buy you a car, and you celebrate, and then the day you're supposed to go pick the car, the person says, oh, I changed my mind. I'm not giving you again, or something came up. Now, that is just one channel that closed. You must understand God as your source. You go to get a job, you had all the confidence, or maybe there's a contract you are pitching for, and then after the whole thing, they say, don't worry, we are giving it to you, just come tomorrow, let's sign the papers. And then you arrive that tomorrow with all the confidence, and then they tell you stories. Now, that is just one channel. God is your source. And never forget it. Because that's something that keeps you safe when there are difficult moments. That whether the economy is rising or is falling, whether Naira is rising or is falling, you know that there is a source. Whether they are doing downsizing in your office and then they are sacking people because things are bad, there is a source. That job is not the source. God is the source. And look at what the Bible, look at a scripture we saw in the first service. 
the problem with putting your faith or your trust in man and not in God. Jeremiah 17 verse 5. Look at that. Thus said the Lord, cost be the man that trusted in man. See, our God is costing people. You will see what the cost is very soon. And make it flesh his arm. Who shall depart from the Lord? What is the cost? Verse 6. For he shall be like the heat in the desert and shall not see when good cometh. The problem, hear this? The problem with trusting man and not using seeing God as your source is that when good comes, you will not see it. Remember again, I told you, there is always a way. But if you are trusting man, you will not see the way. Because you'll be so drowned in the things that failed that you will not see the way that God has made. Are you following me, everybody? He shall not see. Put up, um, maybe, okay, well, I read, I, I used um, a translation in the first service that was asking what you guys said. Glory to God. I think that was um, huh? NET, New English Translation. New English Translation. Jeremiah 17, verse 6. He says, He shall not see when good comes. He shall not see when good comes. Look at NET. NET says, Okay, they have it already. Start from verse 5. Let's do like a mass choir. Are you ready? Let's go. Who trust in male human beings? Who depend on male flesh and blood for their strength? And whose hearts have turned away from the Lord? Next verse. They will be like a shrub in the de desert. They will not experience good things. Even when they happen. Look at it. When there are tough times, good things are happening around you. But if you are not focusing on the Lord, even when the good things are happening, you will not experience it. So you just lose a job or you lost a job, and then you are crying. Actually, people are getting jobs. People are starting businesses. People are building houses. Well, you will not experience it because you will not see it because you are focused on the wrong place. That is the door. If you are in this room and this room is dark, until you focus on the door, you will not get out of this room. So if you are looking else, you are looking at the window, I'm trying to, sh to show you why they will not experience good. Because it is what you are looking at that you will see. Put that focus on the Lord. Acknowledge God as your source. Not the job, not the business, not any other thing. If not, good will happen and you will not see it. Amen. People apply for grants. Put all their faith in the grants. And since the grant is looking like it's going to pay, they've even gone for final documentation. Have you ever expected a grant here? And then finally, it did not work. Through or through? Uh -huh. What you don't realize is that at that time when they are mourning and they are playing, there are other grants happening. And there are other things God is doing around you. Psalm 121, verse 1. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord that made heaven and earth. So you focus on the Lord. Amen. You focus on the Lord. Nehemiah 2 verse 20. Nehemiah said, the Lord our God will prosper us. The Lord our God will prosper us. Psalm 37 verse 5. Do you remember? Do you remember? Commit thy will unto the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. It's about focus. So first thing you do when there are tough times is that you focus on the Lord. Are you here? You acknowledge that God is my source. Not the job I lost, not whatever, not the promises I have. God is my source. Secondly, go back to Genesis 26, verse 2. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I, I shall tell of thee. I shall tell thee of. Continue. So join in this land, I'll be with thee, I will bless thee. Now look at what was happening here. There was famine. Of course, everybody was running away. And God told Isaac, stay back in the land. Now, the second thing you need to do when there are tough days is to seek God's leading. Seek his direction. See, I say it all the time, there is always a way. That way may not be in Google Map. That way is in the spirits. 
if now remember again I told you there's already a way that God has made so when you seek divine leading when there is trouble you are trying to find that way that God already has made you are trying to find that way well there is a way that God has made but if you don't seek it you will not find it when there is proper leading God will lead you into the solution and lead you out of the problem and lead you out of the problem so most times people stay long in issues because they've not asked the Lord what. There was a famine again in the book of Ruth. And a man called Elimelech and his family left where God wanted them to stay. He left with his wife and two children, Malon and Chilon. They left by to Moab. By the time they could come back, Malon had died, Chilon had died, the man had died. What waste. Because actually, divine provision is in divine direction. For where God leads, he provides. And I told you guys, even in first service, there is no business on earth that has not made someone a millionaire. I know someone that I was telling in the first service that is a millionaire because he's selling charcoal. He has big trucks for transporting charcoal. Wealthy guy. Who would have known that charcoal can make someone a millionaire? If there is divine leading, even when there is no way, if God leads you there, you'll find the way. Are you following me this morning? There is no business. Think of the craziest, the most useless business. Now, you now hear that someone is selling charcoal and is a millionaire. You start selling charcoal. <laughs> I know a millionaire, what he sells, that one is actually for the possible. He sells crayfish. Crayfish. You can't enter his cow. He's only smelling. But he doesn't mind. If you don't want to enter, you go down. The cow is always smelling crayfish. From boots. If you don't want to enter, go down. But he's a millionaire. Doing well. Building houses. He's selling crayfish. Now, someone is going to rush to start selling crayfish. That's why I tell people things like, if you want to travel, you want to jack from Nigeria, it's okay. But some people will jack and don't make it. Mm. Because direction guarantees provision. It is divine direction. Ask the Lord. That's why you must master how to hear from God. You must master how God leads. Get our teachings. We have teachings on that. Master how God leads. Ask him, how do I go? Seek wisdom, seek direction, proper counsel. Because not about traveling. I said in first service, it's only in Nollywood movies. That people go to Lagos and make it. I'm telling you, these days you go to Lagos, you just come back. I know a guy that went to Lagos. I'm not laughing at him, I'm just telling you. He went to make it. Actually, he went and somebody promised him job. So he told his people, leave it, travel to Lagos. Of course, when there, the job was not there. I've seen that happen many, many times. So from there to living under the bridge, to being a bus driver, to being a conductor, to learning mechanic, to all of that, and coming back to Nsoka. Nothing. Guess what? You're not coming back to Nsoka. I started practicing that mechanic, whatever he learns. He's living there now. He's married. He's doing well. He's not a billionaire, but he's doing better, no, 20 times better than whatever he was doing in Lagos. Because they said they are packing money there, doesn't mean that if you go there, you will pack. Where God leads, he provides. Let me tell you, this is one of my major confidence as a pastor. That God led me to start this. Sometimes I used to blackmail God. Like sometimes. I say, you know you led me to start this. So if there is no money, it's, it's on you. The confidence that God led into a place. I get what I'm talking about. He's leading is where his provision is. His provision is his, is his leading. You don't know how to follow God's leading, you will miss his provision. That's what the Bible tells us again, that that man that trusted a man will not see when good comes because he will not see where the good is coming from. But by divine leading, you can see the good coming. So these are the days in Nigeria, even as we are protesting, that you begin to ask God for guidance and leading. So that you don't waste your time. Living without divine leading and divine guidance is a waste of time. It's a waste of time. 
Because you might eventually get to where you're going to, but the route will be longer. You would have taken the first road and found that, oh, it's not there. You now trek back to where you started from. Take the second road. Maybe it's the first road you take that will be there. Then you are about 56. Because you are living life by trial and error. I enjoy divine leading. And every time there is tough time, the first thing I do is to return to God and say, Father, what do we do now? Every time. That's always my first call. So what do we do now? Because if I find this leading, I found the way. You're a pastor that I thought this is your ministry. Just can ask God, what do we do now? Find out. He will show you. Money is not flowing. Ask God, what do we do now? Because pastors can come under this pressure of putting their faith in man. I was telling the story in the first service. You know, there was a time in this ministry when we were very young. We we're not just young as per age. We we're young in numbers and financially young. They we were quite very broke. And then this guy, somebody joined church who was doing well financially. And who actually started giving? So sometimes he would give 100k. The highest we received them was 100 or 200k. The day it came in, eh, it was like the Lord has done it. Finally. We never seen that kind of money as a ministry. One, two, three months or so, he left. Not for anything bad. He relocated. At first, the devil said to me, <laughs> your sort of income has left. But there is a knowing. Man is the channel. God is the source. And eventually, I told you there's always a way. So when I asked the Lord, he said, stop focusing on people joining your church, people that have money. Don't, don't think about that. You know, I've never done that. He said, out of these ones, we rise millionaires. He said, begin to teach them faith. Begin to teach them to trust me. That, but if you do that, they are going to grow. And eventually, the work will be sponsored. And that was it. Are you following me this morning? So, you learn, ask God, what next? Money has finished, what next? They just sack you from your job. When you come back, after a prayer of thanksgiving, the next thing is, Father, so what next? What next? If you can find the answer to that what next, you will see the way. So again, I say, divine provision is in divine leading. You can't separate provision and leading. I can tell you this, go and check your Bible. Peter, we wanted to pay tax. What did God say? Go to the mouth of the fish. Go catch fish. Now, you would have gone to catch fish any other day and you would not catch nothing. You would not catch money. But that very day, they went and caught fish and caught money because they were sent. Provision is in leading. Are you getting the point? So, God has put a supply even before your need shows up. By direction and by leadings, he will bring you into where the supply already is. Should I say that again? God has put a, a provision, put away, if, before the need even comes. By proper leading and direction, he brings you already into where the, need, the, 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 the solution is. So that's why we need direction. Number three, what, does, what do you do when tough times come? Go to verse 12 of Genesis 26. And Isaac sowed in that land. Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. You know, many of us look at things like, I'm receiving a hundredfold. But we don't pay attention. Isaac sowed in that land. The irony is this. There was famine. If there is famine, the earth does not produce. But yet, Isaac sowed in that land. Now, you must learn to defy tough days by working harder. When things are bad. When things are bad, the natural thing for people to do is to get tired and stop. Once you stop working hard, you are now working in doubt. The realm of faith, when there is lack, is to work harder. Why are you working harder? Because I know that God will provide. How did Isaac show that he trusted God? He sowed in a land where there was famine. I said this first service all the time. You know, I've said it all the time. Sometimes I come out, I drive out, 9, 10, they are trying to buy something. You can drive almost Holy Nugu. Shops are closed. Why are the shops closed? Where you see money. 
I came by his I didn't sell anything. Two days ago, I didn't sell anything. I beg, let me rest. That's doubt. And that's why we don't make it. In tough days, express your faith in God by working harder. Isaac invested a hundredfold because he dared to sow in tough days. He dared to sow in tough days. We've not seen you in the shop since. Um, that shop. We are coming. I feel that when you are going through your difficult moments, that's when you should work harder. But difficult moments tend to make you to relax, telling you things like, all the while you've been working, what has it paid? That's doubt. Too. That's doubt. That's unbelief. It's even beyond doubt. It's unbelief. All the while you've been working, says, what have you gained? I bet just rest. Isaac sold. So when the Lord told Isaac to stay back in the land, he didn't say, oh, Father, I'll follow your leading. I just sat down and said, no, let it happen. Mm -mm. He went to a land that has been called barren, that has been called dead, that has been declared to have famine, and he stood in the land. That's some confidence in God. Are you following me? That is like saying, well, even though they say you don't used to produce, I will sow you produce for me. These are not the days to, to wake up and sit down at home. These are not the days to slow down your work. These are not the days to stop and say, ah, all this, I'm doing online marketing. I used to sell shoe. I've been posting this shoe, posting Who even see money to buy shoe? It's not the person that's eating that will buy shoe. I beg. I'm not posting again. No, that's when you work harder. That's when you sit down and strategize. I will sow in a barren land and reap a hundredfold. I will sow in a barren land and reap a hundredfold. But the first thing is that you must sow there. Sowing here is not about giving, you no, know, it's not about sowing money. I mean, he got to, he went to farm and began to cultivate. Began to till the earth. A land they say will not produce. Now, how you defy hardship is to work harder. Mm. How you defy hardship is to work harder. It's an expression of your faith in God. So that's like, I told you, come out in the morning. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you are looking for tailoring shop that is open. Have you, who has ever expressed what I'm talking about? All of them are closed. I ask them why. They say, yeah, last time I came out by 8, did I see anybody? I beg. But I, I came. Just that when I came, you were closed. Amen. That man that has faith in God will come out the next day. Put a bigger signpost. Sit down there. Come out the next day. Put a bigger signpost. Sit down there. Why are you coming out every day when nothing is happening? Because I know God is working something out. Now, when God works something out and you're at home, how do you know that it's not today that the big client will come? How do you know that it's not today that the client that will bring the 10 million naira job will come? How do you know? That's why tough days calls for hard work. But not hustle, like the world calls it. It's not like you're hustling, no. You're working from a place of knowing that God provides. I'm doing this because I know that God is working. Are you following me? So Isaac dared to sow in that land. Put up that scripture we saw in the first service. Proverbs 11 and verse 4. Sorry, not Proverbs, rather. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 4. Let's read like a mass choir. 11 verse 4. Glory to God. Are you ready? Let's go together. He that observes the wind, that's how many of us act. You're observing the wind. He that observes the wind shall not sow. Do you want to go to farm today? Ha. The way weather is looking. NLT. This could have changed my life, oh. Even as a pastor. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. Tell the neighbor, say, stop waiting for the perfect weather. Tell the person. Say, go to farm, say, I beg. The, the way Nigeria is looking now, anybody that is just working hard is just wasting his time. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. 2019, this changed my life. Because that time, church wasn't working as I wanted it to work. And I was praying, the Lord said to me, you don't wait for perfect weather. What you would have been doing if things were fine, keep doing it now. A pastor is doing ministry, church is not growing, or so it seems, that in a season of famine, 
in the ministry. Money is not coming. Church is not growing. People are not coming. And then what does he do? Sunday morning, he sits back in the house. So why are you not going today? He said, the one I went last week, did anybody come? No. That's when to go hard. That's when to now. You came on Thursday. Nobody came. That's the thing that I'm you go back again on Sunday. You don't wait for the perfect weather to begin to plant. So there was famine, yet Isaac sowed in the land. You have to dare to sow in this land. Let's do that translation. Amplify. We will observe the wind and wait for all conditions to be favorable. We know so. So Nigeria is no good. This is when to work harder. This is when to work harder. You have to go back and double your work. Not because you want to blow. That's not just it. Because you're expressing your faith in God. So why are you working this out? I trust God. Why is he posting on your status? I trust God. Have you sold anything in the past three months? No. So why is he posting that? Because I trust God. It's an expression of your faith. So when things are not working, that's when to work, to go hard. Shout amen, somebody. Amen. Now, I'm going to say this with practically. It's not about money. But I, I know I've prayed for couples. A couple, trusting God for a baby. They've waited for so long. So, so long. But the baby was not coming. At the time of the prayer, they were not even having much of intercourse again. They just stay on their own. I asked, I said, why? Because pastors should let us ask questions. Say amen. Difficult questions. I said, what do you people? They say, it's been long. I said, why? Say, it's what we've been doing since. Where did the baby come? I said, that's the point. I said, when this prayer works, how will you know it has worked? Do you understand what I'm saying? If you are looking for something that you've not found, that's when to even work harder. It's not to throw in the towel. We converted last year, nothing produced. We converted last two months, nothing produced. So do that, I'm not converting anything. I beg. You see this season, no stress me. No stress me. What are those your slogans? Huh? So you see people loafing around, begging for money on social media, begging people for money because Nigeria is hard. You are begging from a Nigerian living in Nigeria Telling a Nigerian living in Nigeria that Nigeria is hard. So what do you want him to get the money to give you? Are all of you not in the same country? You're expecting supply from a Nigerian living in Nigeria because Nigeria is bad. What is that person doing? He's working hard. What are you doing? You are tired. Work hard. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us, he that does not work should not eat. Mm. Put up a message of this verse. So if you don't work, believers have the right to deny you food. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, scripturally, believers have the right to come say, don't eat our food. Why? You are not working. That's not that of weakness. That's a way to push you to go and get stressed with your life. Because I can tell you the truth. There are many people that are broke today or that are irresponsible today because there are people financing that irresponsibility. I'm telling you for free. And I'm not a sentimental person. Or at least I try not to be. If I give you money two, three times, I don't do anything, I'm not going to give you again. That's the truth. There are many brothers that are on serious, irresponsible. Because I have an elder brother financing that irresponsibility. And if he continues, life will be hard for him. I got what I'm saying. Are you guys following what I'm saying? Now, I don't sponsor I help people, but I don't sponsor irresponsibility. I won't do that. Don't sit there watching the wind. Do your own work. Don't stare at the clouds. Get on with your life. Stop looking at the economy. Say amen. Mm. Get on with your life. If you wait until the wind and the weather are just right, you will never plant anything and never harvest anything. Should we stay long on this scripture? 
God will help you. Things don't always have to fall in place before you start doing something. So there was famine in the land. Isaac sowed in the land. Ah. Glory to God. Next thing, go to verse 18. Verse 18. And Isaac digged again the wells of, of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father called name, father had called them. So Isaac began to dig well. First he was farming, the next he began to dig wells. Let me say it how I said it in the first service. Deploy, I hear what I'm going to say. Deploy all your dormant skills. Use the unused skills. Now, see, don't, this is one of the most important parts of this message. When times are hard, now Isaac has already planted in the land. He thought of what more could I do? He remembered, oh, Abraham used to have well, oh, my father. Let me, and it has been covered. Let me go and dig those wells again. Now, when times are hard, that's where you begin to look for. There are dormant skills in you. There are dormant abilities in you. That you can wake up at that time and break out of that hard season. <laughs> it's not when, when times are hard, you now remember that. Do you know I used to play tear before? I can play tear. Those dormant, dormant potentials are the things you to wake up to do some more when times are hard. So I can tell you, do some more. Do a little more. Do a little more. Amen. You know, that is a way, that is a way people, people become wise when their money finishes. You know, that there's reason that comes with lack. First of all, financial spending, you become wiser. When you see this, you see meat. You see food, you say, must we eat three meats? You are wiser. When there is lack, it's like wisdom just drops from nowhere. He said, everything is not about buying clothes. This program coming up, I can go with the clothes I already have. They say it's trad. It's even, I wore it last month. You know, when there is money, you say, I must say a new clothes. Yeah. So what did Isaac do? Isaac began to look for the wealth of his father and began to redeem them. When there are tough times, look within. What are all those unused, untapped talents? Things that you can do that you've not really leveraged on. That's where to begin to leverage on them. And I know what I'm saying. I was telling the first service, I said, guy I know. He's a content creator today on Facebook. And he is also um, a chef. How did he become a chef? He said, COVID. Everyone was at home doing nothing during COVID. And then he just, a friend of him told him to, because he cooks very well. A friend of him said, make indomie for me. Make noodles. And he made the noodles for the guy. And did a video. Joko, I posted on Facebook. Your guy is now doing noodles, is now cooking indomie. Delicious noodles. Another person contacted him and said, Make noodles for me. Make noodles. He kept posting, make noodles. And everyone was at home during COVID. So people kept demanding, demanding. From there, he thought to himself, This cannot be some more. He said, I'm not making a goosey. I'm not making. He's a big chef today. He was broke before COVID. He's a rich man today. A cook. Those are things he would have ever attempted if he had all the money. There are unused, and I'm just saying to you, don't sit around. When things are bad, don't sit around. Look for, you know, I was telling the first service, there's this comedian. Is he a comedian? He's a comedian on Facebook that said um, that he has not released some of his powers. You know him? Hmm. So when things are bad, that's the time to release your unused powers. Powers you've not used. Strengths he did, he did with it I've not used. You, that, that's why you find out. I can plate hell. How can you plate hair and you're complaining because you've lost your job? While you are waiting, why don't you start plating hair? There are many unused potentials that are just lying dormant that you don't know what they can become. Unless you begin to release them. And that's why in matters like this, you need sight. 
spiritual sides. God will open your eyes to show you what more you can do. I give an example in first service. When things were more rough than it is today for me, I thought of what I could do. And I observed that everybody that wants to buy a book in this ministry, in the ministry then, will always ask me, sir, what book should I buy? Do you know where they're selling it? And I, I always knew, because at, that, at the time, I've read over 150 to 200 books in my life. Christian books. So what did I do? I started selling books. Did you ever buy from my bookshop? Anybody? You see? I began to sell books. I'll go to Abba, I'll go to Bini, buy books, come back selling them. It didn't reduce my anointing or my steeds. <laughs> it did not. It only reduces my steeds when I'm buying the book. Ah, because that book used to use me. Remember I going to Abba? Who has ever been to Adelia Market? If you've not been there, I'm not missing anything, no problem. At least for now. Till they repair that place. I went there. Nobody told me that when you go to Adelia, you don't wear shoes. So may I wash you like a man of God. Came in, bought the book, they put it in carton. And that was the day rain knew to fall. And if you know what this means, if you go to Adelia and rain falls. So I folded emoji. I folded my trouser up. Carried my shoe, I didn't want my shoe to spoil on my hand. Carried the carton on my head. <laughs> Coming back. <laughs> so that's why my steeds reduce more. <laughs> but I'm saying, that kept me alive in that season. Ah, I start people asking me, uh, all the money I'm making from this book, do you have savings, do you have capital? <laughs> I was just laughing at them. That the capital, the savings, everything. <laughs> I need to be alive at the moment. Same capital and savings. It's not when you eat that you have capital. But it came through in that season. So when people now ask, what book should I buy? I say, come to the house. I'm selling books. I told them in the first service, when my dad then came to Lagos, a part I didn't tell them in that first service, when they came to Lagos to do church, my pastor started doing Uber for some time. Say amen. He found out he could drive. So he went around, you know, picking a few persons. What more? My spiritual mom started making muffin cakes. All those cakes. Small smoke and I was selling. And that told us from that business, they bought a car. That business alone, they bought a car. Like it grew so well, they bought a car from that business. But it was born out of adversity. I guess what I'm talking about. And I'm praying for you that God will show you things. I'm praying for spiritual sight. Because it takes spiritual sight to see what others may not see. When times are, when times are bad. Are you following me this morning? May God give you spiritual sight. May God open your eyes to see. Oh, sit for a moment. Let me show you what this spiritual sight is. Genesis 21. Genesis 21. Oh, glory to God. When they go and get stuff. Verse 14. That's not when you sit around. You're working hard and you're looking around. What more can I do? Some of you are in places, you just sit down, say that I'm looking for a job. You finish the NYSC or before NYC is over, you're waiting for NYSC. They're not sending you money because they shouldn't send you money. Okay? Things are just but ask yourself, what more? What more can I do? Are there unused, untapped potential, untapped skills? You are planning to travel abroad. You are processing your papers, and then you quit all your job. You are sitting down waiting. What more can you do? What they've not told is that processing papers could take up to two years. Say, God forbid, but I'm just telling you the life story. What more can you do? It's not when things are hard, you not remember. When we were small, low, we did poultry farm. And I have some knowledge about it. That can be the big break. Especially when it comes by what I'm going to show you now, spiritual sites. Are you following me, friends? I know someone in this ministry, he's not in this center. He was telling me, 
He, he runs a laundry. Actually, you know, that many things actually. Because by the time he first started that laundry, he had other things he was doing. But then, it wasn't moving so well, there were delays. So, in that time, he started doing laundry too. And the laundry started paying more than even the other one, at least consistently. May God, may God open your eyes to see. Look at this. Abraham rose up early in the morning because the background of this story was that Abraham had sent Hagar and Ishmael out of the house because they were mocking Sarah. So he sent them out of the house. He gave them bread and a bottle of water. So Hagar had Ishmael, her son, with bread and water. That's all. And they entered into the wilderness of Beersheba. Of Beersheba, okay? Verse 15. And the water was spent. So the water finished. She cast the child under one of the shrubs. So she was tired and she just hid the child under, under some grass. Water had finished. Bread has finished. Continue. Verse 16. And she went and sat her down over against him. A good way off as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. So she gave up. Sat over against him and was now crying. Hopeless situation you might say. No food. No water in the wilderness. Child was about to die. 17. And God heard the voice of the Lord. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said, I said unto her, What ailed thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God had heard the voice of the Lord where he is. Verse 18. Arise, lift up the Lord and hold him in hand, and I will make him a great nation. Now, everybody pay attention here. And God, talk to me, and God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. God did not create that well of water then. That well of water has always been there. But the God now helped her to see it. When there are tough times, may God show you the well of water. Because actually that child would have died of thirst beside a well. Just because the woman lacked sight. So, some people are dying of lack. But, in reality, there is abundance beside them. But they've not seen it. May you see. I say, may you see. So there are opportunities. There are unused strength. Unused skills. Untapped potentials. But you might never see it until the Lord opens your eyes to see it. Are you following me? There are some of you that are actually doing well. And that stuff you are doing now was born out of frustration. You are in so much lack, you are now thinking, what can I do? And I can tell you some, some students, these are some people here survived in school. What can I do? I don't have money. Money is not first coming from home. I looked around this lodge. Oh, they used to go very far to go and buy pure water. Amen. And I think I have fridge. So what do I do? You start bringing water. Stock in your fridge. And that's it. What can I do? It's by sight. And if you pick the right one in the spirit. If God gives you sight and you pick rightly. You will find out. That. What you thought was a problem. Is actually a blessing. And as he said. Then God opened Hagar's eyes. And she saw a well full of water. So you can see a well. So, so again I want you to see. That well has always been there. That's why the Bible says concerning God. That he makes a way where there seems to be no way. Emphasis on seems to be. Because there is always a way. But there can be cases where it seems like there is no way. How he makes the way is to now open your eyes to see that way. Abraham went with Isaac to the mountain. For sacrifice. He would have sacrificed Isaac. But God said there is a lamb beside. So that lamb has always been there. But Abraham did not see it until God opened his eyes to see. May God open your eyes. I say to women all the time, things are not moving well for your husband. Don't sit at home in the morning every day expecting him to come back from work. Huh? So that you can cook. What more can you do? One of those days, my sister mom was telling us a story. She began to make those muffin cakes. Just cake. And then, 
When they started, when they started newly, she was so broke. They were broke. That was broke. Say their entire income in the month was thirty thousand. Entire income, and they were married. Entire income, thirty thousand. So she had just cooked what they had, but there was no fish. There was no meat. In fact, the day she told us this story was the first day that dad even heard it. He was shocked. There was no fish, there was no meat. And she knelt down and told God, ah, I don't want to serve my husband food without fish or meat. And she was just praying, thinking of what to do. And as I knock at the door, it was their landlady then. I said, ah, I heard that you people used to make cake and all that big and paid. And I went and bought fish and meat. And that was it. Say amen. May God show you a way. That stuff prospered them. And I know many people. And sometimes, if that business continued until, I think it was last year or so, that the Lord led them, and the business had grown, had an Instagram, has an Instagram page, doing very well. Equipment and all of that. It was last year or so that the Lord led them, and they sold the entire business as a seed to someone. Just got the sister and showed the Lord led them, and gave them the business to continue doing it. The name and everything. But this business sustained for long. And she never planned at any time in her life that she would be a cake, a cake maker. Do you understand? But always look around. Is there a well that you can dig? As you're sowing in the land, is there a well that I can dig? Sometimes you have to look at your past. But that's what Isaac did. Isaac looked at his father. Look at the past. Look at your past. What is that skill you learned some years ago you are not using now that can actually begin to pay now? What is that thing that you can do? It might be a regular training you got in church. A regular training you got from home. I give an example like poultry. When you guys are growing up, your father trained fowls or what have you and you are taking care of the pets. Now that times are hard, look around your area. Oh, there is enough space here. Can I get fowl? I was telling in the first service, I don't know how much feed for birds cost. But I know that one chicken now is up to 10,000 or even 15,000. Chicken. And it's funny. Because chicken used to be 2,000 or 2,500. And you are begging people to buy. And I can prophesy, not by the spirit, but via knowledge, that by December it will be more expensive. For all the things I had that you want to do 30 December. And around September or October, you bring those beds. That especially if you have the knowledge. You've done it before. You bring those beds. And then 20 of them, 30 of them, by December, if you sell 30 of those beds in December, and you sell for 10, no, I think it should be more than 10,000 in December. You sell for 15,000 or so in December. You are in 400 or 500 plus. Thousand. And this is not the main thing you are doing. Just that you have to redig some wells. I feel I'm talking about friends. When times are tough, there are not times to cross your leg. Look around. What more can I do? And again, go back to that Genesis 26. Let's start winding down. That verse 18. Your timer is not working again. So you guys get that working. Isaac digged well the wells again of water, which they had digged in days of, you know, and all of that. Next verse, verse 19. Watch. And Isaac's servant digged in the valley and found there a well of spring water. A well of springing water. Every time you dig, you'll find water. Continue. And the headmen of Gera did strive with Isaac's headmen, saying, the water is out. So they dug, they found water, and the Philistines came and said, it belongs to us. And he called the name of that well, Essek, because they strove with him. What did he do? He left them and dig another well. That's what we call resilience. Well, sometimes I'm asking you to, to think of what you can do. Release your powers, the unused potentials. Don't think that when you step and do that, everything will just are you on and become fine. They dig the well, there were all positions, they dug another well. Look at that. And those guys threw for that one also. He called the name of his Sidna, verse 22, and he removed from thence and digged another well. So there is resilience when things are tough. Who is following me this morning? Resilience. You try it again. You try it again. Of course, they don't talk that well. And for, for that, they strove not. They didn't come for it. And he called the name of that well Rehoboth. 
And he said, for now, the Lord had made room for us. God will make room for you. Ah, but it's by resilience. By resilience. Amen. One of the greatest impartations I need in this service is impartation for sight. To see what others are not seeing. To see what others are not seeing. To see a way what others are not seeing the way. To see what else you must do. So you stop complaining. And the Lord can turn that what else you can do into something big. But there's always a way. I know someone is getting blessed this morning. There's always a way. So don't go and cross your leg. You're a master's degree holder, but job is not coming yet. You better look beyond your master's degree and think of the things you learned, the things you can do. What more? Amen. Hallelujah. I told you of the guy that went to UNN. He studied veterinary medicine and came out with a third class. That's not to encourage some of you that, come out, that want to come out with third class because you will not. You will come out with a good result. Say amen. He made third class. And he said by making third class, they got his, his result. It turned on him that there is no way in his life that he will get a job with this certificate. So he just sat down and asked himself, what more can I do? And he remembered, he's an Abba boy. Of course, you know, the average Abba guy can sew. Are you aware? The average Abba boy can sew clothes. So he said, but I can sew. So what did he do? He began to sew ties. Ties. He sew the tie. Have I told you story before? He sew the tie, just can be selling. All over the place. One day he brought those ties into the bank to sell. And one girl saw the tie and was like, let me buy. Looked at her and said, no, 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 no. My boyfriend cannot wear this kind of tie. Have you met such customers? <laughs> My boyfriend cannot wear this kind of tie. So he just said it in a very, very insulting way. He said, he didn't even care. He just collected the tie. I was like, give me my tie. I said, I was going to something minister to him. Why not find out from her? Why a boyfriend cannot wear this tie and the kind of tie a boyfriend can wear? So he went, he went back and said, Sorry, what tie does a boyfriend wear? In her pride. She mentioned the name. Oh, the, 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 that tie, not this, all this nonsense. He said he took note of the name and went home and went and bought that tie and loosened the tie. What is making this tie special? You know that it's in about, about boys. They decrease anything. And it's a very big blessing. I'm not talking about piracy or what have you. But open the check, check, check. What, what is making this tie special? He said they tried to make the tie something like that. He said the first one he spoiled everything. The material everything spoiled. He said he went again. This other time he got it, did it again, did it again, and of course upgraded the quality of his tie. He has one of the biggest fashion factory or whatever in Nigeria and in Africa today. I don't want to call his name. I'm being careful not to call his name. I met him in the conference. Told us the story. I bought his book. And if I call the name of the book now, you will still know the person. So let's leave it. I got his book. And that business was born out of... If I tell you one more thing about the guy that you may need to know, if you can now trace, you can know him. He's a lecturer at last time I met him at Lagos Business School. If you know what that means. I know what I'm talking about. But all of that was born out of what can I do? What can I do? May God give you sight. Amen. May he give you sight. And may he help you to stay resilient. Because things don't always look good, but must be very resilient. Final thing I'm going to say this morning, release your faith. Release your faith. Everything I've talked about now are practical things. Faith is not the supernatural side of it. How do you release your faith? Begin to speak the word of God. Proverbs 18 verse 21 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. So notice what I'm going to say. When things are bad, the easiest things you want to say is to complain. Complain, speak worry, speak fear, 
speak doubt. Nothing is working. Nothing is working in this country. Everything is bad. That's the serious thing. But that's the thing you must never say. Not only are your words changing the situations, your words are also changing you. Something is happening to your heart as you're speaking those words. You're getting encouraged. When you're saying like this Nigeria and eh, now wow, you are hearing yourself say those things. But I wish somebody can speak in faith and say everything is working. You should have talking sessions in your house. But apart from that, even your everyday conversations, say the right words. Wake up and tell yourself, God will come through for me. Things will work. Things will fall in place. Yeah. So, that point when things are bad, that's when you begin to say what you must. Don't speak fear. Don't speak worry. Don't speak defeat. Don't speak unbelief. Just speak the word. Things are fine. Things are falling in place for me. For me. And I talk about confession all the time. Do you know why? The two aspects I want of life, of the two major things you must master to do life successfully on earth is divine leading and faith. If you master these two areas, you'll be a successful man on earth. Divine leading, taking the right step at the right time. Faith, releasing the power of God to work for you. These two things will make you whatever you want to be in any area of life. So you begin to speak the word. Don't say what you see. Say what you want to see. Don't say what you see. You've not sold for the past five days. Somebody say, how is business? Don't lie. Okay, because I see people that do that. Say, ah, business, we are selling, no, oh, we they sell. That's lying. You can tell the person, well, uh, you know as Nigeria is now, but don't worry, things are getting better. Never let the devil have the final say. Never let the wrong confession be the final say. Things are getting better. And things will turn up very soon. That's why I'm going to come out tomorrow too. I'm going to market harder. Because I know things are changing for me. Always have that confession. Always have it. I get to the point. Are the depths still there? Say, yeah, well, yes, for now they're there. But they're getting sorted. When people hear you talk like they wonder, it's like somebody has promised him something. Well, somebody has promised you. God promised you. And you can count on his promise. Who is following me this morning? God promised you. You can count on that promise. You can count on promise. Have you paid your school fees yet? Well, no. But I will pay soon. I will pay soon. But apart from this conversation, have regular talking sessions in your home. At least once every day. At least once every day. When you just stand up talking to nobody, I am talking to yourself. Things are getting better. Depression days are over. And flourish. You just talk. I tell myself that. I said, I talk to myself. Instead of using bedroom, I notice many people use bedroom period to think about their life. Is anybody like that? Huh? Well, if you're not like that, it's either you are not like that, or maybe you are really like that. Because I don't have a very good bedroom. Mm, there are bedrooms you go to, you have to hurry up and come out. Ah! Poverty is a, a madman. That's one bedroom we used at the time. If you enter there, you don't spend up to three minutes, but snake may bite you, and it's not even figure of speech. Snakes will bite you. You say, can I see everything anybody? No. God is our provider and our sec security. But someone has seen snake there. In the bedroom. So when you get there, you're You're not thinking about your life. <laughs> you're thinking about surviving. You just buy very fast and run out. Well, there's sometimes you just get into the toilet or the bedroom. You just sit down. It's not like you're doing anything. You're just thinking. When you find yourself there, stop that thinking pity session. Begin to release your faith. That's when you use a talking session. If you have a mirror in your bedroom, instead of sit, sitting there watching the mirror, look at that mirror again. I say, you, you will flourish. You are pointing at yourself. Things will get better for you. You are breaking out of this season. And the Lord is bringing you to your wealthy place. You look at them and say, you, Rehoboth has come for you. The Lord is making room for you. Look at them and say, you know, sometimes I like talking myself sometimes to myself in the third person pronoun. Just like the time he said. 
Say, my soul, why are you downcast? You think he's talking to someone else, but it's himself. Why are you downcast? You, things will turn around. Weep not. Cry not. You're talking to yourself, oh. Because things are getting better for you. And you are increasing on every side. You are spreading on every side. The days of defeat are gone. The things that brought me shame no longer exist. Now the Lord is prospering me. And he's giving my business visibility. Many men will hear. Many men will cooperate. And they will walk with me. Kings are coming to my rising. Praises to the brightness of my light. I will thrive. I will flourish. The days of contempt are over. You're talking to yourself. Ha, after that kind of talking session, you step out. It's like they pumped new energy into you. Do you feel like that? It's like somebody's, somebody just charged. It's like battery that was dead. And you plug it. And you're charging. That's why some of you need to minimize the time you spend on social media. Except if you especially rather if your social media is not edifying at all. You know that there are people that are on social media, but social media is very edifying. I give an example. My Instagram is a very edifying page. How many people do I follow? <laughs> you get the point. I don't see. I tell you, as well my Instagram. You cannot see twerking video on my Instagram. You cannot see people writing on my Instagram. You can't. Like, if I'm checking, I can't. I follow about, I follow about, I mean, for something people. Uh, for something. I even reduced it last week. So if I open, is it that? That's a clip. This one is preaching. But then, if you go on social media and all you are seeing there are complaints. This week now, there will be news about protest. Even this new week, it will increase. Two people down there. Somebody broke there. Let me say, tell you what I believe. Nigeria is hard. Nigeria is hard. Nigeria has always been hard. I think, sincerely, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think some people are shouting because the hardness in Nigeria is finally getting to them. We've been feeling it since. But we did. I'm not here to complain. I don't grumble. I don't murmur. I rejoice. I speak faith. That's how I behave. My life is turning for good. I say my life is turning for good. This situation is not lasting forever. I'm coming out of it stronger and better. That's how to talk. That's how all of you are in the same shop. All of you are maybe mechanics in the same shop. Customers are not coming. Others are very sad. But somehow you are not sad. I have been with your friends and they are wondering why are you, why are you always hopeful. God's word gives us hope. Hope oh, there is hope for a tree. When it is gone down, at the scent of water, it shall sprout again. Say, ah, it's like someone has promised something. Nobody promised you nothing. But God promised me. God promised me. You know, I, I, I was listening to a pastor. I was with him and he said, he, a friend of his came. And the guy is a pastor doing well, wealthy. And he was telling his, friend, his church members, now that is friend, an old friend, pick the mic and I was telling his church members, you see this is your pastor. Even if, sorry, even if he's not your pastor, he will still be this rich. He said, do you know why? The guy has always been positive from the time he was in school. So that guy, he never he tells, I'll never be broke. And he keeps making moves. He said, before God, before God called, called him to ministry, he had already written some proposals to oil companies. Because when you are hopeful, you dare things. Get the point? When you are hopeful, you dare certain things. So, place they say you don't enter, you just try to enter. Because you are hopeful. Stay hopeful. Things are getting better. I said, things are getting better. So, stay in faith by speaking. Don't allow fear. How else do you stay in faith? Still be upstanding. How else do you stay in faith? Don't give room to compromise. Be upstanding. Stand like six o'clock. Mm -mm. Don't stand like one o'clock. <laughs> See, man. Uh, stand straight. That's what I mean. You don't understand it. Don't give room. Now, whenever a believer begins to compromise, he has left the zone of faith. 
Compromise is that you are trying to find solutions in your own way. Look at what the Bible said in Psalm 112. It says, the man that feared the Lord. He said, blessed, he said, blessed is the man that feared the Lord and delighted greatly in his commandment. Why did he say the man is blessed? No, we always quote this second part, but we don't pay attention to why the second part will happen. He says, the man that feared the Lord, have the fear of God in tough times. Let that fear of God stop you from going to do Yahoo. Let that fear of God stop you from doing hookup. Let that fear of God stop you from selling people's money. Let that fear of God, because I, I don't want to compromise, I'm trusting. You can't be trusting God that you're compromised at the same time. That's not faith. He said, Blessed is the man that feared the Lord, that the light of his commandments. What happened to him? His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Verse 3, what did he say? Wealth and riches shall be in his house. His righteousness is forever. So when you trust God and you are showing it by refusing to compromise. They are selling in, your, in the shop. And when they sell, other workers you have, they change the, the receipts. They change the price. So they can take like two or three thousand. And for some reason, the only person not doing it. And they say, why? He said, because I trust God. He said, leave that in. Why you go to the zone? You have heard all of those? Why you go to the zone? It's not about compromise. It's about working hard. We are not saying you should sit down and do nothing. We are saying you should not compromise. Compromise have left. If you compromise have left faith soon, and now we don't believe. I will not steal your money because my God can provide for me. Even when things you are bad, church that your sister rose as even a treasurer since this church started, she can tell you I have never demanded for church money. I have never taken church money. Do you know why? It's not because I had all, had all of it, but because I know. If I begin to do that, I'm no longer trusting God. I'm not tr trusting my strategies and my gimmicks. You want to get out of tough times? No room for compromise. No room. Are you following me, friends? Again, what do you do in tough times as, as, as you're expressing your faith? Please be generous. Be generous. Give. Listen, I'm not saying you begin to throw money around where you are broke, but listen to me. Do not let lack be the reason you don't become generous. The much you have, give. We see the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 17 with that widow. Met the widow. The widow had nothing. She had her last meal. She was about to eat it. And Elijah requested for it. And she said, I don't have anything. Elijah said, I know. But come bring what you have. Because what God is saying, that flow will not finish. And of course, it did not finish. Because where there is generosity is another way you are showing that you trust God. The reason we hold back the little we have is because we are sure that when it finishes, no other one is coming. And that's doubt. Are you following me, friends? Are you guys following me? Proverbs tells us 3 verse 27, we should never turn down an opportunity to be generous. To do good. To give to him that needed. Never. Proverbs 3 and verse 27. Every opportunity to do good, look at it. Put up penalty. We told not, they do not we told good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. I'm very broke, but there's somebody I can help. Well, I will help you. Are you following me? I saw them in the first service when we we're planning our wedding. Okay, since we are okay, we are getting money, but we had that money for something. You know, when you're planning events, money is never enough, there's always something to do. But then, in the heat of all that planning. I had to intervene. I had to help a minister. I went to see him. And things were not looking good around. And I knew. I went to the pastor to that day. I just went to say, I just told him, come, let's go see this guy. And after I spoke with him, he didn't tell me. I said, don't worry, give me your account number. I didn't send him much. Like I said, in the first service. it wasn't much, actually. But the point is that we had many things to do in there. Okay? Why I said it wasn't much is, um, I think God has blessed me. So if I send you 50,000, I don't count it much. But that's what I sent to him that day. But it was in the heat of planning. It was in the heat of planning. And why was I confident enough that when God put it in my heart, I could release that money? Because I know that the God that put it in my heart to release it can bring more. It's an expression of faith. That's why when you are broke and they say, we are giving in church, don't get angry. You know, broke people are always angry. They like, once you mention money, they get pissed off. <laughs> don't get angry. 
don't get angry. When they say you should, nobody is forcing you, don't worry. Just don't get pissed. People that give do not give because they have. They give because they are generous. What you need to have to be able to give is not money. What you need to have is the spirit of generosity. Once you have the spirit of generosity, you will give. So you don't give because things are okay. You give because you're a giver. So that woman had nothing but gave Elijah her last meal. And that was an expression of faith in the prophet. How else would she have shown that if she believed Elijah if she didn't give that last meal? Elisha had the same story. The woman also gave her last meal. And the oil kept flowing. I get to the point. They were in the wilderness. Jesus and the disciples. And the young boy had only five loaves and two fish. Possibly his lunch. Possibly it would not even be enough for lunch. But guys, she, he dared to give it to Jesus and just ask for it. And just multiplied it. He fed many other people and they went on with much more. Only God knows how much that boy went on with. He just had his lunch. But he dared to give it out. So whenever an opportunity to give to be generous comes, it's also a way you express your trust and faith in God. Finally, how do you express your trust and faith in God? In tough times, please stay joyful. Stay joyful. Stay joyful. Isaiah 54 verse 1. Sing, O barren. Sing, O barren. Sing, O barren. Imagine telling a barren woman to sing. Instead of crying, sing, O barren. Hallelujah. I want to see people practice these scriptures when they get home. When things are tough, you lock your, you lock your room and begin to shout. Hallelujah. I begin to sing. Glory to God. Glory to God. You're just dancing. I still got joy in chaos. Woo. I say, as money come, I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under. I'm not held. You know the song, right? He will... mm. So I would tell me. He Don't just know these songs. Many of us just know songs. We just don't know when to use them. You don't use these songs in church. You know this song now. Well, I don't like saying this. So it's not confused. The, the choir. This song is not a praise song. It's not a worship song. But it's not a bad song. You know what I said now? I praising God by saying, you get the point. I have still got joy. You're not praising God. But you're saying there is a time to use such songs. You learn them in church to use them when the occasion calls. I get what I'm saying. You lock your room. I'm not held by my own strength. And I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Yes. I will not be in Jesus. He's never let me down sing. He's never
Zacu. When it's all red, I never read for you. Whenever you read, that's when you lock your door. With tears in your eyes, you are singing it. Uh, off key, key Z, key Z, you are singing it. I won't be going under.
The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no head in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Ha! It means when everything is bad, that is a he's not say yet. Say yet. Ha, the money is not coming. Yet. Oh. I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation. You know what James said? James 1 9 said, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he's been exalted. The brother of low degree. That brother that this nothing is working. Let him rejoice in that he's been exalted. Finally, something to practice. Job 5.22. Job 5.22. I'll close down. At destruction of our mind, thou shalt laugh. <laughs> Put up an LT. You know the translation. You will laugh at destruction of our mind. Open your eyes. Look at destruction. Look at our mind. Look at laugh. Look at lack. Obey the word. Laugh at destruction. God will walk it out. I just said that in my spirit. God will walk it out. God. Oh, 
Verse 19. Finally, before we go, well, have you been blessed today? What a service. When the going gets tough, we don't say every other thing, we list everything that's happened. Read with me, everybody. Of you already personalizing it, so let's take it again. Personalize it now. Tell me this will pour out of my windows, laughter will spill through my doors, things will get better and better. Depression days are over. I will thrive, I will flourish. The days of contempt are over. Is that your testimony? Between now and December, fortune has changed. You will go and apply these things, and the impartation that follows the message will bring things to pass. I already announced that, by the way, there will be many people struggling to have their thanksgiving because there will be so many testimonies. And I've already said if you want to be part of them, you better inform us early because we will take some on Thursday, some on Friday, so after the session, there will be so much. Because you have, a, you have something, you know what thanksgiving is? It means something God has come for thanksgiving means God has done something for you that you just cannot keep it to yourself. Get the point. You know that song? It is coming from my heart. You know the song? Yeah. 